Hi, my name is Chris Monsieur. I'm a faculty member in Civil and Environmental Engineering. Welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at uh, Portland State University, sponsored by uh, Trek and NHTSE. Today we're very pleased to have one of our uh, faculty from one of our partner campuses, uh, the University of Utah, to present today. So uh, Dr. R.J. Porter is going to talk to you today about geometric design, speed and safety, and you're in for a real treat because he's one of the very exciting safety researchers uh, in the field and we're very pleased that he was able to come today. So I'm going to turn it over to R.J. All right, thanks a lot, Chris, and uh, thanks for the invite out here. Portland is certainly uh, one of my favorite places to be, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I saw on the uh, Trek Instructions for Friday seminar speakers maybe to spend a little bit of time providing some background uh, as to how I got to this particular position for me. Uh, how do I get to come to this beautiful campus every day and work with some of the best uh, faculty members and students in the country um, at the University of Utah? And so I don't quite know. I think I lucked out uh, quite a bit. But I'll provide you maybe with a little bit of a unique uh, background compared to possibly some others that you've, you've heard. I grew up right around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and many of you know the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, Pittsburgh is steel city, uh, at one time the greatest steel producer in the world. Quite an interesting history if you get into steel production in, in Pittsburgh. Needed for steel is some coal, uh, some materials uh, that need to be used to, to make steel. So around Pittsburgh, conveniently, it was the steel producer, we have coal country. And so as you work your way to the south of Pittsburgh, you certainly enter coal country in the United States, so that's where I grew up. If you read around this time when steel was really being produced at a rapid rate in Pittsburgh, uh, and sort of the emergence of Andrew Carnegie, maybe a name that you've heard, you start to see that there is these little, called patch towns, uh, developing in this part of the country, in coal country, and you see some of the uh, names up there really small, not very creative, Vesta number three, Vesta number four, Vesta number five, all associated with the coal mines. And so these were where the coal miners lived. Also around this time, a heavy uh, Eastern European immigration, and including my uh, mom's side of the family from Yugoslavia. And so I actually grew up in one of these coal patches, uh, this Vesta number six. And at the time, you know, when they originally started, the houses were owned by the coal companies, the grocery stores were owned by the coal companies, and that's what was kind of hung over the head of the coal miners uh, to get them to continue to work for wages and in conditions that would probably not be acceptable today. But at the time I lived there, that time had passed. Uh, but there was still a heavy Eastern European uh, influence, as I said, including my family, and still a lot of hardworking coal miners, um, including my dad, who was a coal miner from the time before I was born, until just recently we convinced him to retire a few years ago. And so how does this fit into my career path? Um, well, it was certainly in my mom's head that I was going to go to college. We had no idea what to pick. I come from a family of coal miners. It's hard to find anybody in this area that's not a coal miner, mechanic, a farmer. Um, so again, back to Pittsburgh, coal production, steel production. I want to work with steel on some sort of a construction site. And I was at least smart enough at the time uh, to link that to civil engineering. And um, from there, I went to the other PSU in the other part of the country for a couple years in this civil engineering degree. Ah, yeah, this is kind of fun, uh, but I'm sure I'm spending a lot of time at a desk trying to figure out these math problems, physics problems. I think I want to be a coal miner. Had an opportunity to work at a coal mine for one summer and for part of that time to actually go under the ground in these coal mines. That was enough, first off, to give me appreciation for what these folks work in every day, very dusty, noisy, dangerous. Um, so it scared me back to school. I finished my civil engineering degree. It scared me so much that I couldn't stop. I hung on to the university life uh, with both hands and continued to go and, as you can see, made my uh, mom a pretty happy person. And so uh, certainly a lot of interesting things happened along the way to get me interested in the transportation field. And I'd be happy to talk to you about those uh, if you're interested afterwards. And so that's kind of how, um, you know, I chose this path first of civil engineering, had some very influential faculty members uh, in transportation engineering that attracted me to that field. And once I got to the end of this Virginia Tech stint that you've seen there, I just enjoyed what I was doing so much that the only way I knew how to pay back those faculty members was to become one myself and hopefully have, have some good influences on some folks to choose this, this field also. So now back to the talk, geometric design, speed, and safety, or as I like to call this particular talk, why do we get what we get, and how do we get what we want? 
Um, a lot of controversy surrounding this topic of speed. A lot of maybe thoughts and opinions that we have problems with speed-related outcomes. I want to try to take a look at, at this topic. And I chose this topic. I was trading some emails with Chris. What should I talk about? I chose this. It's not a very technical topic. It's actually based on a paper that doesn't have a single equation in it. It's not even based on brand new research. It's just a different way to look at what we should already know. Uh, but for some reason, it's really clicked with a lot of people that, again, believe that there's some issues with speed-related outcomes of our design decisions. And it seems to explain to them maybe why we have those issues. For me, it often feels like I'm taking us through a maze and we come out the other side and we don't quite know where we're at. So I kind of feel like the Riddler uh, in, the, in the Batman comics that, you know, I'm going to raise a bunch of questions, maybe all of them we won't have answers to. And so let me start with a little bit of background. There's a lot of terminology that sort of captures this interaction between geometric design, speed, and safety. And a lot of this terminology you see here is based around the idea that, again, we have some speed-related issues. In rural areas, people drive too fast. And if they happen to be in a crash, that crash is severe. In more urban and suburban areas, people drive too fast, and that causes us to be a variety of users to be less secure, land, surrounding landowners to feel less secure, too much noise and so forth. All of this related to the idea uh, that our speed-related outcomes are higher than maybe what we would desire after we design some facility. And these terms here are really terms that sort of capture the idea that we should be able to design a roadway as self-explaining. We should be able to have some target speed that we select with our stakeholders and design the road so that the speed outcome is consistent with what we wanted the speed to be with in the beginning. And obviously, as I talk about this, I'm really focused on, on vehicle speeds today because this is where we, we think there is the issue. So in terms of going back, we've talked about this for many years, but we seem to not be making a lot of progress on how to design some facility to result in some target speed. Um, now we have some emerging tools. One of those is the Highway Safety Manual. I don't know if many of you have heard of the Highway Safety Manual that allow us to predict the safety consequences of our design decisions. We also have a report that was completed uh, a few years ago, uh, TRB, a synthesis report, looking at everything we know about the relationship between design decisions and resulting operating speeds. And so with these two things in mind, I thought it was time to just go back and take a look at sort of the history of this concept and what we know now about sort of the speed and the safety outcomes of our design decisions and how those things interact. So let me first begin with design speed. How many folks have heard of design speed? Okay, great. So design speed is something that's essentially selected by the designer that will influence the other design decisions are, that are made. So we'll, we'll look at design speed selection pretty early on in the design process, and then it influences other dimensions of the roadway, essentially, all based on this initial selection of design speed. So you see that definition here, determine the various geometric features of the roadway, the speed used to do that. A logical one here are the four primary considerations in selecting design speed. Topography, more mountainous areas, lower design speed. Uh, anticipated operating speed, again, this idea that we have some target speed for our facility, some, f some speed we want to design for, our design speed should con selection should consider that. Adjacent land use, I think you can kind of, you know, guess how that fits into uh, whether we're going to select a higher design speed or a lower design speed in the functional classification of the roadway. It sounds innocent enough. So for somebody that's heard of uh, design speed. Can you maybe quickly tell me, is a vehicle traveling above the design speed less safe than a vehicle traveling below the design speed? A driver in a vehicle. Or if I had a roadway where all the speeds were above the design speed and a roadway where the speeds were below the design speed, which one was safer? We think probably the road where all the speeds are traveling below the design speed, right? particular for the civil engineers in here, we can't help but think this way. Anytime we design to something, everything that actually happens has to be below that. And it comes from really structural design, right? Let's say we're designing some bridge, 
there's going to be some maximum load that's allowed to use that bridge. We're going to expect that most of the loads that cross that bridge are going to be less than that maximum load. Every once in a while, we may have something above it. And so that's our inputs. Let's add in a little factor of safety. And for all the civil engineers, how many times have we multiplied something by 1.1, 1.2, 1.3? We need to add in that factor of safety. And that's going to be our design load for the bridge. Let me take you through a little bit of background that shows that for some reason we think this exact same way about design speed. Again, we just can't help it. It's, uh, it's in our DNA to think we have to design for something and everything occurs below that. Let's first look at the history of design speed. Before that definition I gave you, the very first definition was the maximum appro approximately uniform speed, which probably will be adopted by the faster group of drivers, but not necessarily by a small percentage of reckless ones. And so we have this design speed. That's the speed that the faster drivers are going to go. There may be some reckless ones, and everybody else is below that speed. Then we had a revision from night, for the longest time period. Design speed definition was the maximum safe speed that can be maintained over a section of highway when conditions are so favorable that the design features of the highway govern. So we've now related design speed to the maximum safe speed. So if you're above that, you must be less safe than if you're traveling below the design speed. Here's just some data that you'll find in a pretty old version of the AASHTO design, road design policy. Um, I've just converted the data to graphical form that again shows this basic same idea, that if we select a low design speed uh, down here, 20, uh, 30, 35 miles per hour, the off-peak low volume, so people are free to choose their, choose their own speeds, is going to be right around the design speed. As the design speed increases, this off-peak speed, again, where people are choosing their own speed, increases, but not at the same rate as the design speed. So again, we have the same basic idea that here's our design speed. Every, people are going to travel below it. Even in some of our more context-sensitive publications for design, let's say, of urban thoroughfares, we see the same basic idea. If you have a target speed of 25 to 35 miles per hour, select a design speed of 30 to 40 miles per hour. And remember this, because I'm going to show you a case study with a design speed of 40 and a target speed of 35, and we'll see how things turned out. Then finally, a survey that was done to practitioners. How do you select a design speed? In urban areas, I figure out what the speed limit's going to be. That's my target speed. I either select that as a design speed, or I go 5 mile per hour above it. In rural areas, what's going to be my speed limit? I always go 5 mile per hour above it. So the same basic idea. And so hopefully with this... I've convinced you that the structural design philosophy carries over to the selection of design speed that we select. We designate a design speed. You find it early on in a set of highway or street design plans. That's a little bit above what the speed limit's going to be. And we expect people to go somewhere right around the speed limit. Maybe 15% of the people are going to travel above the speed limit. The rest of the people are going to travel below the speed limit. All right. That's design speed selection. Now what happens? Well, this design speed, as I said, influences a variety of other decisions. And here's just a couple of examples. Here on the, uh, let's see, your left side of the screen, here's my design speed, my capital V. I'm going to use that to determine how the roadway curves, the horizontal alignment, the horizontal curvature along the roadway. And so I selected my design speed. It's going to tell me what is the minimum, the smallest radius of curve I could use, or the tightest curve that I could use. Stopping site distance, people need to be able to see far enough to react to something and come to a stop. The primary input to that is the design speed, and you see that in, your, in our stopping site distance equation. So these are what we call our design criteria. After we select our design speed, we determine minimums and maximums for different elements. Minimum radius of curve, uh, maximum grade, minimum stopping site distance, and so forth. Let's continue this um, discussion. Let's look at minimum radius of curve. And so we have our design speed. We then have to select this thing called the maximum super elevation and the maximum side friction factor. So all these things together then tell us what is the sharpest curve we could use, what is the tightest uh, radius uh, that we could use along this section of roadway. What would you think that the maximum side friction is based on? I don't know what you think, but for me, I think, well, that's the maximum amount of friction that would be available 
to provide some sort of centripetal force for somebody traversing a curve. It's based on limiting values of friction. And above that, there's not enough friction where somebody can maintain their circular path. It actually has nothing to do with that. It's based on driver comfort. So our thoughts on above which, if somebody feels a certain amount of side friction, they get uncomfortable. And you could see here the difference between how much friction we actually have available on wet pavement as we traverse a horizontal curve. That's the red line. But what we call our limiting value in design criteria, that's the blue line. There's quite a, quite a difference. And so the maximum side friction factor has nothing to do with the maximum amount of friction available. And so we're calling this a limiting value, but it's certainly not a limiting value. What happens? Here's our minimum radius used for design, the blue line. If we really wanted to base it on limiting values of friction, we would be able to use radii as tight as the red line. So there's, we've now selected a design speed. We've determined these minimum and maximum values, but there's a lot of fluff uh, built into those minimum and maximum values. Then what? Well, don't use those minimum values. We're engineers. We've got to use above minimum values uh, whenever practical. And so we've got our design speed. We've got um, our limiting values, then using above limiting values. What this does now is essentially makes the design speed we originally selected meaningless. We selected a design speed. We determine our minimum values, maximum values, then we use above the minimum values. And so the decisions that we make really don't show much reflection of that original selection of design speed. And so what we've done in one of our publications, me and a couple of my colleagues for quite a few years, has started talking about this idea of inferred design speed. Understanding that the driver sees the roadway, they have no idea what the design speed stamped on the first couple pages of a set of plans are, but this thing called inferred design speed might provide some sense of what the drivers actually see. And so we take these ultimate design decisions made by the designer, the constructed roadway, and we back calculate what would have been the design speed for that particular element. So again, to take you through the example, you'd pick a design speed, you determine your minimum radius of curve, you then select a radius that's above that minimum, and you design in your super elevation, we now take that ultimate design decision and back calculate what would be the design speed for that curve. That's the inferred design speed, and we compare that to the original design speed. So now, let's go back to our conceptual graph here. We have this idea that we're, from an engineering perspective, we expect to select this design speed. Most speeds to be, or the speed limit to be added or a little bit below its speed to be around that actual operating speeds. And now, since we've designed for above minimum criteria, we have this inferred design speed that is usually higher than design speed. The only time it equals the design speed is when the ultimate design decision was equal to the minimum value that we determined based on that design speed. And here's what we end up with. Um, the, the middle, the dotted blue line, and this green line I've showed you before. The dotted blue line represents in this case, actual speeds people are traveling equal to the design speed. Here's what we expect with this idea that people are going to travel somewhere around the speed limit and below. Here's what we actually get. For design speeds less than 50 miles per hour, mean speed is above the design speed. So the average speed that people drive when the original design speed selection was below 50 miles per hour is higher than the design speed. For 85th percentile, that occurs over right about at 55 miles per hour. So again, if we select an original design speed at 55 miles per hour or less, and we go through this design process as I explained, it's quite typical then for actual 85th percentile speeds to be higher than the design speed. So we have a lot of issues in this mid to lower speed roadway design in terms of getting operating speeds to be what we intended. Let me show this a little bit more as part of a case study. Um, again, an urban collector from the other uh, PSU nearby runs adjacent to a golf course, bicyclists, pedestrians. Um, you see some of the characteristics of this facility. A design speed of 40 miles per hour was selected. So what do you think the target speed for this multimodal facility was? 
35 miles per hour. That was going to be the original posted speed. And you see some other characteristics of the segment. I won't spend too much time on this. Some, it was a divided cross section, a nice median, a nice flowing alignment as you would be taught in your highway design class. You know, it looks pretty good uh, for in plan view. We don't have any sharp curvature and so forth. Let's see what happens. Here was the design speed, 40 miles per hour, this pink line. Here was the original posted speed, 35 miles per hour. We went through the design process as I explained, as explained in design policy, which resulted in an inferred design speed between 60 and 75 miles per hour. So we have a target speed of 35 miles per hour and our policy has guided us to a process that has resulted in an inferred design speed between 60 and 75 miles per hour. At a minimum on this facility, it still only goes down to about 55 miles per hour. That's on the sharpest curve that we have on this particular segment of road. So what is the operating speeds going to be? 85th percentile speed. It doesn't drop below 50 miles per hour on the entire stretch. Mean speed, right around 50 miles per hour, 15th percentile speed. So only 15% of people are traveling lower than 45 miles per hour. So guess what had to happen? We typically base our speed limit on the 85th percentile speed. The speed limit is now 50 miles per hour. So the facility was open for a while, tried all types of enforcement, surprise vehicles, didn't have anybody in them, all these types of strategies, and the operating speeds could not be lowered. Finally, let's post this at 50 miles per hour, where the 85th percentile speed is, even though we have a design speed of 40 and our original target speed, because we have different types of users on this facility, was going to be 35. And so I now presented you with a new scenario. We have our designated design speed for this facility. Now we have a speed limit above that design speed. And then we have operating speeds ranging with design speed on the lower end of the operating speeds and quite a bit of operating speeds on the higher end of the speed, on the high side of the speed limit. What do you think? Is it a safe or safer facility? This gets us into some issues. You can imagine if a crash occurs and you find yourself in court trying to explain to people who aren't engineers how you tell you have a speed limit that's somehow higher than this thing you call the design speed um, that you've selected early on in the process. I don't have any reason to believe that this makes the facility any safer than if the speed limit was below the design speed. I don't think there's any proof out there that indicates that to be the case. And in fact, if we're to continue with this design process that we have, we may want to consider this more often. If we have a target operating speed of 35 miles per hour, we might want to select a design speed of 25. And actually, at one time, I thought that I read that sentence in the new Pennsylvania and New Jersey Smart Transportation Guidebook, but I've never been able to find it again, so I may have been dreaming that I saw that, that it was okay to select a design speed below your target operating speed, particularly for an urban and suburban road. So what do we do to try to fix this? Um, again, there's sort of been a lot of focus on this idea adapted from roadway design in Europe of self-enforcing, self-explaining roadway design. Let's de design the facility so it's clear to the driver what speed they should be traveling. And again, we've talked about, we've tried many different approaches to get this to work, and it still doesn't seem to be soaking in. And so what I wanted to do is just go through a couple questions related to this. Why perhaps aren't we successful, or why perhaps aren't the practitioners latching on to this idea that we could design a facility that would result in operating speeds that are close to our target speeds? Now, I don't have time to go through... Um, all five of these questions. Let me just visit uh, three of them. What is known about the relationships between road geometry and operating speed? To what degree does road geometry actually influence operating speeds? And then what is the nature of the speed safety trade-off according to the information that we currently have available? And that's where some of those publications that I mentioned at the beginning comes in, the Highway Safety Manual and the Operating Speed Synthesis Report. 
Uh, so here's the, I mentioned the safety manual. Let's look at what is known about the relationships between road geometry and operating speed. And so again, this synthesized information, existing research up to the time, which I believe was uh, 2010 or 2011, we had 10 authors from five different countries. Um, and we found that much of what is known is from North America, and particularly for rural uh, two-lane roads. The first thing I want to present to you is that there's a couple dimensions to understanding operating speed. And some folks will say that it's actually not the ma speed magnitude that's important. It's not how fast people are traveling, but actually the spread in speeds, the variability in speeds, and that it's this property uh, that can actually be more related to safety uh, than speed magnitude. And so here, all I want to point out here is to keep in mind these different dimensions. Here's two distributions uh, that have the same 85th percentile speed, 65 mile per hour. As you can see, they have different mean speeds, and they have different numbers of people that would be traveling different speeds. And so decisions that we make can not only impact speed magnitude, but could impact this variability in speed. And we need to start to understand more information about effects on these two different properties. And actually, we don't, we don't really know a whole lot. Uh, oftentimes, decisions that could be made to perhaps manage operating speeds are avoided with the fear of increasing speed variability. But again, it's usually subjective, intuitive. We don't really have a lot of information yet on how our decisions impact these different properties of actual speed distributions. Now this starts to get a little bit interesting. To what degree does road geometry influence operating speeds? We always had this idea in mind that if we can, let's increase the radius of curvature and provide some tighter curves. Let's reduce the lane widths. And this would result in lower operating speeds. Based on the models that we have right now, first off, this red line actually represents the relationship between that design speed that I mentioned at the beginning and horizontal radius of curve. And because the horizontal radius of curve, the minimum, is so sensitive to our design speed, we think, well, operating speed, actual speeds, must be sensitive to horizontal radius of curve. But as you can see here, we really don't really see any effect of the horizontal curvature on a road on operating speeds until we get to some pretty tight radii. Let's see, for rural two-lane roads, the blue line, we really don't see speed reduction until we get to radii inside of 1,000 feet. Urban collectors, line is almost completely flat. And so that sensitivity to actual operating speeds that we thought was there, at least according to some of our information that we have right now, is not there. Let's look at lane width. We've always had this idea, let's reduce the lane width, and drivers will select lower speeds. But as you can see here, that relationship is likely not as sensitive as what we had in our minds, that we can narrow the cross-section, result in lower speeds. Now I'm going to bring up some questions regarding these models, but this is what we have. This is the information that we have right now, uh, based on our research, that it doesn't appear to be a heavy uh, uh, relationship between operating speeds and these different design decisions. Now let's bring in what we know about safety, and I've represented that here with a crash modification factor. You may or may not have heard this term. Basically, as it increases, the number of crashes that we would expect increases. Well, sure enough, as soon as we get to this radius that would start to re result in a reduction in operating speed, our tools are telling us that it's also going to result in an increase in expected crash frequency. We go to lane width. Yeah, maybe we can manage speeds a little bit by changing lane width, but according to these models, as lane width decreases, the expected number of crashes are going to increase. And so our current tools are telling us that there is some sort of a trade-off. The decisions that we can make to manage operating speeds are also going to increase uh, the expected number of crashes. And so let me summarize what I've, I've talked about so far, and then I just have a few more maybe minutes of recommendations. The design speed definition, I showed you the first innocent definition that was there. But if you review still some um, state design policy, for example, you'll still see some carryover of language that still relates design speed to this maximum safe speed, even though I hope that I've proven to you that that's really not the case. 
We have issues with our design of mid to lower speed facilities, and we're, we have operating speeds that are higher than design speeds whenever the design speed is less than 55 miles per hour. Whether this is desirable or not, we have absolutely no support for. And in fact, we, if our design process remains the same, we probably need to look more and more into this idea of selecting a design speed lower than the operating speed if we want to achieve our target speeds. And then finally, um, whether this idea of using the geometry to manage operating speeds is going to work, at least according to our current set of tools, our synthesis of research that I described, it does not appear like it's going to work because it looks like the decisions that we can make to manage operating speeds, first off, they don't impact operating speeds as much as we've always thought. Secondly, there appears to be a trade-off with expected crash frequency. So where do we go from here as some possible uh, recommendations? There was a workshop uh, that was held uh, with a variety of speed researchers, speed practitioners in 2009, and I absolutely really like this uh, description of where we need to go, the broad objective. We need a process where speed-related transportation outcomes of highway and street design alternatives and decisions are quantified first off, and the speed-related decision rationale are consistent and explainable to a variety of user groups and stakeholders. I don't know about you, but what I've just gone through for the past 30 minutes, that's not very explainable, right? So really what we're talking about here is hopefully moving away from a step-by-step -step design criteria process. I select my design speed. I determine my minimum radius of curve. I select above the minimum uh, radius. I de determine my design speed. I determine the minimum lane width based on the ADT and so forth. Hopefully we can start to move away from that and move towards what I have demonstrated here, a much more performance-driven performance-based design process. Let's think about it. We make transportation investments and we select projects to support some sort of social goals. And you see those listed here. And this is where the interactions of engineers and planners can really be effective. My planning colleagues at the University of Utah, they're really good at understanding this whole process that we're making investments to support social goals and here's what they are. How do we support those, provide transportation support for those goals? Um, me and my, some of my good colleagues here at Kittleson, uh, from here in Portland, started to look into this issue. What, what do we mean by providing direct transportation support? And what are the transportation outcomes that are related to our design decisions? And you see the categories that we came up with here and recommended, accessibility, mobility, quality of service, reliability, and safety. And then finally, how does geometric design decisions and speed influence these different performance categories? For the planners in the room, these concepts, you may say, yeah, that's what we're supposed to be doing. But from a design perspective, a designer's probably never even thought about the issue. Many designers have not thought about the issue of accessibility as a perhaps a more robust measure of mobility. And so this is what I mean by a performance-based design process. Now here's the challenge. How do we figure out how our design decisions and particularly our speed-related design decisions impact these categories? And this is where we've had a lot of challenges. It's very difficult to quantify things in transportation. We're dealing with so much uncertainty, so much uncertainty in the driver and other user groups that this is the challenge, but this is where we're trying to succeed. It's a particular challenge with safety. It's very difficult to quantify the relationship between decisions that we make and safety. And you saw some of those trade-offs I mentioned, that it appears that any decision that we make to manage operating speeds is going to reduce safety. That cannot, I, I don't believe it. It has to be an artifact of how we're conducting our modeling. So maybe a couple of recommendations to improve this. We usually have one group of researchers and research projects that work on the speed-related studies and one group of researchers and research projects that look at safety. We need to figure out some way to integrate this all together. How can we actually incorporate operating speeds into our safety models? I challenge you to find, even though we think safety is, or speed 
is so linked to safety, find me a speed model that actually incorporates the operating speeds. I don't think that you'll find it, but if you do, please send it to me because I need to know about that. I mentioned lane width. Does it, is it really just lane width on a facility that impacts operating speeds, or do we need to look at the entire cross-section together? Do we need to look at criteria combinations? And we need to think that the outcomes might be a little bit outside of the box. One thing that I'm concerned about is even with the development of the Highway Safety Manual, guess what? You won't find a CMF in there that's inconsistent with design policy. There's probably a good reason for that. But from a safety perspective, can we really expect these nice parallel lines that a reduction in lane width impacts safety regardless of what the shoulder width is, that a reduction in shoulder width impacts safety regardless of what the lane width is, and that it's this consistent with what we've always thought? There's no way. But that's what's in the Highway Safety Manual. Even though there's research that shows that's not the case, that there could be cross-section combinations that actually reduce operating speed and improve safety because of these interactions between the different elements. So I'll show you a couple examples here quickly for rural and urban roads. And finally, guess how we develop these models? We chop up the road into a variety of extremely small segments. Then we look at the number of crashes on that segment, we look at the speed, and we develop our models. There has to be a more holistic way to look at the entire alignment of the road Again, to look at the cross-section holistically and try to predict what the outcomes are going to be. And we're actually seeing some emerging research that shows that you could design a stretch of facility to result in a low operating speed due to the horizontal alignment. But as long as it's a consistent design, you actually see a reduction in crashes as well. And so you'd actually introduce some horizontal curvature which our current models would tell us are going to increase crashes, but that's not the case. Is if you consistently do it to where a driver interprets the entire stretch of facility together and selects the appropriate operating speed, we do see a reduction in crashes. And so there are some solutions uh, starting to emerge. And so I'll stop uh, with my riddle me, riddle me this, riddle me that uh, uh, questions, and hopefully this was... Uh, useful and uh, provided some insights into why we, we see some of the things that we see. Certainly we have information that shows that crash severity is heavily related to the speed that somebody was traveling um, when they were in a crash. And then there's sort of the famous graph that shows a non-motorized survival rate, right, as the speed of the crash increases. Uh, what this particular graph was, um, let me just go back to it here. Again, based on our tools, we have a... This is for a rural two-lane road that shows that um, as we would reduce the lane width, the expected number of crashes um, would increase. And actually, in that methodology that we use, we would say there was no, no change in the severity distribution. And so you're, you're absolutely right, and there's better ways to, again, incorporate this severity outcome as w in addition to the crash frequency. Um, but... Uh, again, there are some, some of our tools show this to be the case. There has been some research that showed that expected crash frequency even decreases as lane width goes from 12 feet to 11 feet. But again, that's a little bit different than the language we'll find in our design policy, so that actually did not make its way into the highway safety manual. Other questions? Oh, yeah, 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 sure, yeah. Kevin Wright. Um, so I, I don't know much of anything about the Highway Safety Manual, but it just seems like it's 
like maybe idealistic or like really impractical. Um, it's like not taking into well, I guess maybe more more or less why why are things like operating speeds why haven't they been taken into account in the past? Okay. So a couple of points there. I guess first off, realize that before the highway safety manual there was nothing. And so we based what we thought was safety on the design criteria that our gu I guided us through. And so if we meet that criteria, we're appropriately safe. If we don't meet that criteria, we might have a safety issue. And so certainly the highway safety manual is a step beyond that, where we could actually start to quantify, maybe conduct some benefit cost analysis of our design decisions. As I said, right now my concern is that we're still, as engineers, uh, having trouble maybe thinking that a safety outcome could be different than what we've always thought for the past 50 or 60 years. And so you might see, for example, a study conducted on lane width that actually shows a reduction in crashes. This is a hypothetical example, but there are real examples. Shows a reduction in crashes as lane width decreases. Um, but that's different than we thought. And so the research becomes highly, highly criticized and may not make its way into the highway safety manual. So right now, there's sort of these two documents that are working together. It's going to be hard to put something in the highway safety manual that's inconsistent with what's in the AASHTO design policy. And that's what I'm seeing. I haven't seen anything in the safety manual from a design perspective that appears to be inconsistent with what's in the AASHTO policy, even though I showed you quite a few research studies that show this interaction between lane width and shoulder width. I could show you a synthesis of a variety of studies on lane width that indicated a potential uh, safety improvement as one goes from 12 foot to 11 foot. There's stuff out there, uh, but that's sort of the challenge. I think, you know, part of it is from a, you know, liability perspective and, you know, the, the society that we have to, um, you know, introduce that information that could be a little bit different than what we always thought. And so if there's some uncertainty, the safe thing to do for us is to say, well, this is how we've been doing it for 50 or 60 years. Let's keep doing it. Uh, there was another part of your question that I, is that right? <laughs> okay, so that comes down to more, I think, data-related challenges. Oftentimes when we, you know, a lot of our safety models are sort of statistically driven. We use statistical methodologies to rate things th together. We need sample sizes. And so often the smallest time period that we look at crashes is a year. So when should we collect the speed to relate it to the crash frequency for that year, or do we have to collect the speeds for the entire year and what sort of data collection infrastructure do we need to do that and so figuring out this whole aspect particularly in rural areas where we oftentimes don't have all these data collection technologies installed at different locations how we actually do that I think has been more the limitation there than anything else um, you said earlier that potentially after a crash you might be kind of asked to justify that speed, do you mean in a litigation? And if so, is that really common? I mean, I mean usually you think of, kind of people suing each other over accidents, but not necessarily over what the speed limit was. Well, I think it's very, very common. Yep. And again, sort of that situation, uh, trying to ex explain that scenario that I set up there that could you really be telling people that they could drive faster than what you said the design speed? was that this policy over here said is the maximum safe speed. Uh, that would be really tough to explain, even though I showed that essentially the design speed itself is, is sort of meaningless from a safety perspective. Um, don't come from an engineering background, uh, but you've you mainly talked about lane width and, uh, and curvature radius as, as the two kind of main features that are, that are augmented. They were just my examples. Oh, okay. I chose one that would be more related to the roads, what we would call the alignment, and other that would be related to the cross section. But there could be quite a, quite a lot of other features that influence what operating are, speeds. What are some new ones that you talked about are being introduced from from the from the European model that you think are having a positive impact? Well, I mean, I guess the biggest difference we see in, in terms of Europe, right, is the way that we do enforcement. I mean, the, 
the most effective thing to do would be to put speed limiters in all of our vehicles that are GPS based and if we're on a certain facility type of facility we can't go above uh, certain speed. I mean that would be the most effective solution but we probably may not have much luck uh, in the US for a little while. Um, but there's always been the discussion for example of the roadside. Can we use the roadside, the median, different types of features um, to make somebody feel like it's really sort of more constrained. That example I showed had a wide, the typical wide 20 to 30 foot clear zone, the wide median, no sort of tree plantings or anything. Because again, the engineers might say, well, if there's a runoff, what happens if there's a runoff road uh, crash and I find myself in court and I'm trying to explain why I put these things in here. Um, so that's, that's been another example of a debate that you'll see in the literature of can we use you know, different aspects of the roadside, for example, uh, to influence operating speeds. The other thing you do is make the pavement a really poor quality probably, right? Yeah. yeah. So my question was, um, you talked a lot about like crashes. Um, it seemed that it, it was thoroughly examined in sort of uh, road design considerations. And, uh, but my question was mainly, was, uh, was the actual number of uh, fatalities? Uh, I didn't hear that much about fatalities uh, when, when it comes to the, uh, road uh, speed design. That's, That's a great, great question. question. So we're trying to improve the way that we relate our design decisions not only to the frequency, the number of crashes, but also their severity outcomes. Now it's a little bit difficult because maybe there's this indirect influence through speed. Again, if we can design to result in a high number of drivers traveling at a certain speed, we might be able to reduce the crash severity. Other things, it's usually the age of the occupants involved, whether or not they're wearing a seat belt and so forth. And so you know, what I'm seeing so far is that it's not necessarily the road geometry that is having a huge influence on severity other than this indirect influence uh, through speed. Um, but we're still trying to improve what we know there. Curious about your, uh, your example. So you have a posted speed of 35 and, and you design it for 40, but you observe that people are actually driving like 55. Do you ever, and then let's say you change that speed limit to 50 or 55, do you ever revisit to see if that 85th percentile actually goes up again, or does it typically stay the same? That's a great question. Um, I guess with, that would be great data. I wish I had for this example, the before and after. But generally speaking, um, there's been a number of studies that really showed not much of an effect of posted speed on operating speed. And so in this case, Right from the beginning, the speed limit was 35, the design speed was 40, the inferred design speed was above 60, and so the 85th percentile uh, was about at 55, I think I showed. And so then we have some other um, guidance. It's more than guidance, the manual and uniform traffic control devices, some actually uh, some standards and so forth that indicate that posted speed limit should be somewhere around the 85th percentile speed. So they were pretty they were probably in trouble here, and if somebody got a speeding ticket going 35, um, I know I'm not off the record here on the camera, but I usually teach my class to figure out what the 85th percentile speed was there before you, you pay that ticket. Uh, so we had to, they had to reduce the speed limit some. They're probably a little bit hesitant to go all the way. Well, it was 50, I believe, is what it ended up in the end. So still, it, they got to within about 5 mile per hour of that 85th percentile speed, which is what the MUTCD tells you to do. I mean, I think the common situation that uh, you're speaking of there is oftentimes you might be traveling in a rural area. Maybe the posted speed is 70, 65, 60 miles per hour, and then you're coming up on some sort of a rural community. And so that community would desire lower operating speeds, we have the surrounding land use changing, and so usually there's some sort of a step down from 65, then you'll see 55, and then 45, maybe all the way to 35. Again, the challenge is usually the features of the roadway don't change. 
And so people have a lot of trouble. First off, they've been traveling 70 miles per hour uh, for the last 40 miles, and then you're trying to reduce them to 35, and you're not doing anything to the roadway uh, to uh, result in that change. And so uh, we call those rural transition zones. There's some emerging research on how we could better uh, achieve that speed reduction, but it's certainly a challenging area from a speed perspective. I mean, I think there is uh, a couple of driving simulators that really simulate the forces that you feel when you're driving, and those are the ones that are probably going to be the most successful at at investigating speed-related issues. It's it's very difficult, and one of the reasons people get sick in a simulator is they see the roadway moving, but they're not feeling any of the forces. And so, when you're not feeling any of the forces, it's really difficult to replicate that speed selection process that drivers have on a facility. And so I think to an extent it can. For some of the more high-end simulators, it can better. Uh, but there usually has to be sort of the follow-on field work and observations as well. Um, Susan Weissman, uh, are there any guidelines for designing for inferred speed, or is that not something that anyone would dare do go against AASHTO and the Highway Safety Manual? Um, it's not really against uh, either one of those, and it actually is catching on. I, I think of all of the research that I've been a part of so far, this, this concept of inferred design speed has caught on in the practitioner community probably more than anything else that I've worked on. And so I think uh, um, people are starting to recognize this, that this is more representative of what the driver sees and maybe we could use this early on in the design process to make predictions of what actual operating speeds are going to be. And I should say that, uh, you know, my colleagues, Eric, Eric Donald at Penn State, John Mason now at Auburn, and they've been working on this concept of, of inferred design speed is for, for quite some time. Uh, John Mason was the one in the, you know, many, many years ago that laid out the concept and sort of a speed profile type approach that this is what this inferred design speed looks like and we may want to start to pay attention to it and then many years later we were able to actually add some data uh, to that concept. Uh, I think the, the relationship between the operating speed and the geometry may be varied because of the characteristic of characteristic of the driver population or the profile of the driver population. For example, my kind of the, the parkway in New York State is one of the most uncomfortable, most stressful road I ever drove on. And it's because people drive, drive so fast, the lane is very narrow, I think, and then the, the curvature is, is pretty bad, but everyone is driving very fast and much faster than probably midnight here on, on I-5. Uh, so would that be something that can work into the model as well? I think, I mean, certainly there's an effect there. The challenge that we often have on the engineering side is we want models that actually use data that we have readily available to us, and that's often you know, if, if we're working on some project, sort of the projected driver population could be very difficult to predict and gather and incorporate that into our models. But yeah, you're actually right. I mean, there's certainly uh, influences as you travel throughout the U.S., different operating speed characteristics. I lived in Texas for a few years, and they're, they're rural two, they had rural two-lane roads that had a wide shoulder that were then converted to four-lane undivided facilities and had a posted speed of like 75 miles per hour and I was scared to death. So uh, certainly a difference, particularly even as you travel out west um, and you start to see that with some of the recent changes in posted speed limits as well, including in Utah. Another question from the web about um, sort of safe, the technology of the vehicle and how those have improved over time um, and perhaps contributed to this creep for tolerance of um, over designing the roads. And then uh, my add on to this would be if thinking about the future and connected vehicles, how would that play into this kind of question? Yeah, that's, that's a great question that I probably don't have an answer to, but it's something that we're all thinking about. How do these 
at least on our side, the design side, how do these vehicle technologies and particularly connected vehicles, autonomous vehicles, how is this going to influence our everyday practice and the way that we've always thought about things? And, you know, how is that going to change the capacity of our facilities? And with that, do we need this many lanes or can we reduce lanes? And, you know, since vehicles are going to have some sort of control over lane position, I mean, all these types of questions I don't have any answers for right now. And I think we're... Um, we're starting to, to think about that. <coughs> All right, before we give uh, RJ another round of applause, the speaker next week, uh, which we were just huddling about, <laughs> is uh, Jake Walker from Metro is going to talk about some of uh, their modeling efforts they're doing. So thanks, RJ, for a great day.